Hey, welcome to another ground lesson. This one is going to focus on uncontrolled aerodromes. And by now, if you have not made yourself acquainted with the AIM, I highly recommend that you grab yourself a copy. It updates every six months. It's available for free, and it's one of your best pilot resources that you can have. So in my previous video, when we we're talking about the circuit, I was really focusing on talking about circuits in a controlled airspace. So in a control zone, you have a controller who is keeping traffic separated. So therefore, they do have the authority to clear you into the circuit, however would be most convenient for them. Therefore, in a entry to the circuit pattern for controlled airport, that's why you can enter pretty much as cleared. So at a 45 to the downwind, straight into the downwind, straight into the base, or straight into final are all perfectly acceptable. However, in an uncontrolled aerodrome, you no longer have a controller. So traffic needs to separate itself, and therefore pilots should only ever approach from the upwind side, which I also call the dead side, and um, make their approach to the circuit via crossing midfield to join the downwind. They can join direct into the downwind if no conflict exists. So because there is no controller, it's up to the pilots themselves at uncontrolled aerodromes to maintain enough physical separation between aircraft that they don't create a hazard to each other. Determining which runway to use at an uncontrolled aerodrome is up to the pilot, but it's for the best interest of safety of the flight. So if there's already aircraft in a circuit for a specific runway, it's in the best interest of the pilot and for safety to use that same circuit. If there's no one else in the area, then checking the windsock to see which uh, runway is favored by the winds would be a good way of figuring out which runway to use. And then you would like to plan your approach descending to circuit altitude on the non-circuit side or the upwind side or the dead side, as I like to call it. Once you are at circuit altitude, you can cross the runway at midfield to join the downwind at circuit altitude. Now, if there is no other conflict and you can be absolutely sure that there is not going to be any kind of conflict, pilots can actually join onto directly the downwind at an uncontrolled airport. However, usually crossing midfield is how uh, it is done. And remember that all descents shall be made on the non-active side. So all uncontrolled aerodromes are gonna have a frequency assigned to them, which you can look up in the CFS. It's important to note whether the frequency is a mandatory frequency or whether it's an ATF or a common frequency. Um, no matter what, if you have a radio, you should be monitoring the published frequency and you must monitor if it's a mandatory frequency. Common frequencies are gonna be one, two, three, two for an aerodrome without an MF or an ATF. And one thing I'm gonna to touch on here but not go into detail is you must know the reporting requirements for operation in the vicinity of an uncontrolled aerodrome. Look them up and read them. They will probably be on your written exam as well. It's CAR 602.96 to 104. So an ATF or an aerodrome traffic frequency is a frequency that is not a mandatory frequency. Now the difference between these types of uncontrolled aerodromes and MF aerodromes is that over here in this world, you might have non-radio equipped aircraft or radio equipped aircraft, but who can't transmit, so uh, receiver only. Since that is the case, these pilots are not going to be broadcasting. So pilots are required to be extra vigilant in their lookout and make sure that they are watching for non-reporting aircraft in that aerodrome environment. So if you're going to an airport that has a mandatory frequency in effect, keep in mind the following. Some airports have advisory information available and you'll usually pick that up in the CFS because instead of saying TFC, it'll say RDO, which means radio. So when you're broadcasting, your intentions on that frequency when you're doing your approach about five minutes out, then you'll probably hear a response. Uh, you'll Number one, you'll broadcast to um, airport radio as opposed to airport traffic. And then you'll get information on what runway is actually in use based on the winds. And they'll probably also give you traffic information. So whether or not someone is in the circuit. Now that you have your information, you can actually plan your approach to go directly into the circuit uh, almost the same way that you would do if you were in a controlled tower. Now you have to broadcast what you're doing and you have to let everyone know what your intentions are and you're still responsible for all of your traffic separation, but you're no longer required to do the other procedure, which is to always approach from the upwind side. 
Now, if you're going to an aerodrome like Chilliwack, for example, where there is no airport advisory information and you broadcast all of your intentions to Chilliwack traffic, then you should actually be approaching the circuit from the upwind side as you would at a ATF uncontrolled or any other uncontrolled airport um, to make sure that you are doing your best to stay separated from all of the other traffic. Um, they do have this really weird exception, um, which says that if you have no doubt that there's going to be any conflict, you can actually join the circuit as per the paragraph above. However, in order to be as safe as possible, plan to do your approach from the dead side to cross midfield to join the downwind as you would any other uncontrolled airport. Okay, let's look at a local example. So here's Hope. We've got the runway 0725. We've also got, oh, look, it's an ATF. And... Um, we know that it's left-hand circuits because there's nothing here in the procedure section to tell us that there is a right-hand circuit, and we know that the standard is left. So for example, if you're coming in from the south, you'll probably want to check the winds before you even depart to try to have an idea of which runway might be in use. Because depending on which one it is, the way that you approach this uncontrolled airport is going to be different. Now, if your plan was to pass over top of the airport to check the windsock in order to determine what circuit and what runway should be in use, then you should be planning to do that at least 500 feet above the circuit altitude. We usually say around 1,500 feet above aerodrome elevation. This keeps you well out of traffic in the circuit, depending on what circuit is in use. So let's say it's a nice calm day and you know that the winds are favoring 2-5 and you'd like to come in straight in for the downwind for 2-5. Uh, but you can't or you don't want to because that terrain is right there and it's making you uncomfortable. So what you should do then is you should plan to keep it high and pass uh, 1,500 feet above the, uh, the aerodrome elevation or 500 feet above circuit altitude. Then descend on the dead side to cross midfield and join the downwind base and final for runway 25. So now let's look at a different example. And this is an example of an uncontrolled airport with a common dead side. And I'll show you what that means. So here we have Seashelt. It's also an ATF. So we're not even in the mandatory frequency world yet. So we're still dealing with uncontrolled ATF airports. And we know that this one has a right-hand circuit for runway 11. And because there's no mention of runway 29, it still remains the standard left-hand circuit. So it, let's say hypothetically you're coming into Seashelt from the east. Um, the smart thing to do that I usually teach my students is to um, come in via the north side of the airport. The circuit is always going to be on the south side because it's a right hand for 1-1 and a left hand for 2-9. So what you can do is you can know in advance that you're always going to be descending on that side, which is the common dead side, no matter which circuit is in use. So you can plan your descent on the dead side and then cross midfield to join the circuit. And as you're crossing midfield, you're a little bit closer and you can get a little bit of a better look at that windsock and pick which runway you're gonna use. When you're departing an uncontrolled airport, make sure that you fly the runway heading until you're at least circuit altitude before commencing a turn in either direction on course. And if you're going to make a turn back towards the circuit or towards the airport, you should not be doing this until you are 500 feet above circuit altitude. This only makes sense to make sure that you are not conflicting with anyone in the circuit. Now, I know I said I wasn't going to cover it, but here we go. So the mandatory reporting that you have to do and a mandatory frequency area, according to RAC 4.5.7, are you must listen to the mandatory frequency and maintain a listening watch before you enter a maneuvering area, so a taxiway or a runway. On departure, first and foremost, you have to make sure that it's clear and safe for you to maneuver onto the runway. Call before you move on to the runway and then let everyone know if there's going to be any kind of delay prior to your departure. On arrival, they want you to make that call five minutes before entering the area, if possible, uh, giving your intentions. But the main calls they also want you to do are when joining the aerodrome traffic circuit, when on downwind, when on final, and when clear of the surface. If you're doing continuous circuits, the same calls of, as above apply. And then they also want you to report if you're going to be flying through the mandatory frequency area five minutes out, let people know what you're going to do, and then report when you're clear of the area. So there you have it. I think we've covered everything there's to say about uncontrolled aerodromes. The main thing is that because there is no controlled tower and no radar, just watch out for other pilots. Uh, stay safe out there and have fun.